right, good morning, everybody. Happy Sunday. Welcome back to C3. If you would, please come on in and join us as our service kicks off this morning. <laughs> if you're willing and able, I'll invite you to stand as we begin our time in worship together. Give thanks to the Lord, our God and King. Once again, good morning and welcome back. We are so glad you've joined us here at C3, where our mission is to love Christ, love our church, and love our community. We want everyone to be able to join us this morning as we have fellowship with one another, pray, read scripture, and spend time in worship. For everyone here at the Unity Center, you can find lyrics in the next room. As for those joining us online, you can find lyrics to our songs on web, our website, c3anchorage.org when you click on the music symbol that flies in. 
Also, if you are with, here with us online, whether on Facebook or on Zoom, we would love to hear from you. So I'll encourage you to use the chat box to say hi or just let us know that you're here. Our call to worship this morning is from Psalm 100. If you would join in reading that with me. Shout for joy to the Lord, all the earth. Worship the Lord with gladness. Come before him with joyful songs. Know that the Lord is God. It is he who made us and we are his. We are his people, the sheep of his pasture. Enter his gates with thanksgiving and his courts with praise. Give thanks to him and praise his name. For the Lord is good and his love endures forever. His faithfulness continues through all generations. Psalm 23. The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. 
He leads me lie down in green pastures. He leads me beside still waters. He restores my soul. He leads me in paths of righteousness for his name's sake. Even though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil for you are with me. Your rod and the staff, they comfort me. You prepare a table before me in the presence of my enemies. You anoint my head with oil. My cup overflows. Surely goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life, and I shall dwell in the house of the Lord forever. and pray with me. Dear God, you are so good, so gracious to us. Thank you for sending your son, Jesus, to this weak and weary world. 
Through Christ, you took on flesh and you came to save us. In Christ alone, we have eternal hope. Lord, you are our strength and our comfort. Your power gives us no guilt in life, no fear in death. You command our destiny, Jesus, and nothing can separate us from your hand. Heavenly Father, we long to meet you face to face. We long for that day when you return or when you call us home. And until then, Lord, we ask that you would equip us with strength and stamina to stand in your power and allow you to complete your work in us and in this world. We love you, Lord. Let your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Amen. Good morning, C3. Good morning. Is this too loud? Too loud? Just right? You remember, I get louder. I, I tend to get louder. So if it's too loud, somebody can turn down the red one. Um, oh. So I think before I get started today, there's something I got to say. Um, there's a couple of things that have been on my heart, I think, uh, this week, or one specifically, and seeing Joe back with us uh, last week. Um, first of all, it's great to have Joe back with us. Um, but it made me think a lot about Bob. And sorry, we're starting this sermon with crying. It's going to happen. Um, but what a special, special man Bob was. And uh, for me specifically, and you still are, Joe, um, but I don't know if you remember this. Years and years ago, we were still in Totem Movie Theater. Uh, and, and Dan Kraus, our pastor at the time, said, hey, I'm going to be out of town. And Kyle, I need you to preach. And I thought, I have never preached a sermon in my entire life. You're crazy, Dan. And he goes, ah, it's in John. You'll do fine. And I remember I spent three weeks going through this sermon, uh, making sure it was absolutely perfect. I mean, if this is going to be my first sermon, it, it better be spot on. And I remember those three weeks, I was actually, uh, I, I could, the spiritual attack was real. There were things in my lives where I was like, who am I to be giving a sermon? You know, how, uh, I'm not, I'm not a pastor. I haven't, I haven't gone to seminary. I don't have a, a PhD in theology. Who am I? who am I? And I could really hear the adversary saying, you're not good enough to do this. And I got done with that sermon and it was an okay sermon. And I will never forget uh, Bob coming up to me after that and giving me a hug and saying, you need to do that more. Um, and uh, if we're allowed to have fans, I think Bob was one. And uh, probably the reason I'm still doing this today between Bob and Joe just being so affirming um, and, uh, I know, I know Bob probably thought the music was too loud most Sundays and he would, he would give me, uh, give me a little bit of a hard time for wearing a hat every now and again, or heaven forbid wearing shorts to church, but he was, uh, uh, he was an amazing man. And, uh, when we talk about discipleship in the church and how the important of this, uh, generational ministry and having some of those old people, right. Of which now I probably am to some people who are willing to come alongside folks and see them develop and grow. So that's point number one has nothing to do with the sermon. Uh, but that was on my heart this week. So, and I didn't cry as much as I thought I would. Okay, good. Uh, second one, significantly less important is this is the last time any of you will see me with a mustache. Uh, my wife is happy about that one. Uh, this is my last mustache march in the Air Force. It gets shaved this week. I think Ellie called dibs on being the one to shave it off on Thursday. So enjoy it while you can. Uh, uh, and as you can all see, Ben is not here today. Uh, he is traveling. He's flying back today from uh, Chicago. So he's been down there on some uh, um, denominational business. And uh, so it, he's not here. You get me today. Uh, but it's actually kind of exciting. I'm kind of excited because we're gonna start a new series today uh, and I get started. Uh, and so for those of you who are unaware or you live under a rock, it is Easter in just a few short weeks. Um, and we're gonna take the time between now and Easter to take a look at who Christ is. And that might seem like a easy question to answer, but we're gonna, 
in order that we can fully understand his death and his resurrection and what that means, we need to understand who Christ is. And we're not going to do this all in one week. Obviously, we're going to spend the next three weeks going through this. And there's a lot of churches in the world right now um, that are observing a season called Lent. And depending on what church you grew up in or um, where you grew up, Lent is done a little differently. Even the timing of Lent is a little different. But historically, it's between Ash Wednesday and Easter. It's 40 days. It's a period of time. And it's a time of fasting and repentance and prayer and about drawing closer to God through our knowledge of and reliance on him. And uh, some people give things up for Lent, right? Uh, Some people don't eat meat or some people won't drink alcohol or uh, maybe the modern day version is maybe we don't watch TV during Lent. The idea is that you'd give something up. Uh, and there's no right or wrong way to, to do Lent, right? So whatever your church background is, however you observe the season specifically or, or not, that's, that's between you and God. But in that vein, though, uh, much like when we talk about at Advent, right, the season leading up to Christmas, where we're expectantly awaiting the, the arrival of Christ, you know, we set aside this time before Easter, and I want to say somewhat arbitrarily, right, the, on the church calendar to say, here's this time to do this thing. You know, this is the season of growing in intimacy with God. And I would argue, much like Advent, this should be our desire every day, every season. And I understand that it's good to have like a set aside chunk of time, right? Something specific for a specific reason. uh, And that's important. I get it. But I really want us as a church to spend this time, these next three weeks, knowing who God is, not just knowing of him really knowing the heart of God as we approach Easter. And before we do that, uh, I have a small story to share. Um, Those of you who have known me for a while, you know that I am terrible with names. Um, I'm horrible with names. I can meet somebody three or four times and I cannot remember names for the life of me. And um, I'm I'm gonna dime my dad out on this one. I blame my dad. I blame genetics. Maybe that's the easy way out, but I do. Um, When we were, I was a teenager. I think I was 14 or 15. My dad was finishing up seminary and he actually got a call to be a a church planting pastor in Eastern South Dakota. And so we went and planted a church and much like our church plant years ago was meeting in a school and just recently meeting in a school, we too were meeting in a school and they had the, you know, the standard Midwestern exit church model, right? Where church got over, everybody grabbed coffee and donuts, they fellowship for a while. And then my dad, who was a pastor, he'd go stand by the door, right? And shake everybody's hands as they left and no doubt went to Pizza Ranch for lunch. Um, by the way, if you're not from the Midwest, Pizza Ranch, real deal, good pizza. And it's where everybody goes after church. So uh, on their way out, he would do that. And uh, I, I noticed that he would go and he'd grab my mom, you know, before he went and stood by the door. And I thought that was nice, you know, but before it was time to say goodbye, if he was heading to the door, he'd always do the scan of the room, you know, wave my mom over, you know, it's time. And then she'd come and she'd stand next to him. And I thought, well, that's nice. It's nice to see my parents, you know, standing there talking to people, just socializing. Um, But he had a reason for doing that because my dad was horrible with names, but my mom was great with names. So he'd bring her over to stand next to him. And I don't know if they had some secret signal, hand signal, or like, I don't know what it was. I'm sure it was something. But when somebody was approaching the door and my dad couldn't remember the name, that was my mom's cue to jump in and be like, oh, Bill, Marsha, it's so great to see you again. How are the girls doing at school? And because she could remember everything about everyone. And by the way, those names are made up to protect the innocent. (laughs) But anyway, so I blame, I blame it on my dad, my inability uh, to remember names. Uh, But here's the thing, I realize that I'm bad at that. So I've had now 25 ish years to work on this. Um, And so for me, the trick is not just trying to remember a name, but trying to remember something about somebody. That helps me remember names. I have something to associate their name with. And so when I meet people, I'll ask them their name, but I'll ask them something else. Like, like who are you? What do you do? 
so I know something about them that I can associate with who they are as a person. And I'm not going to tell you all my secrets on, on that one. But leading up to Easter, as we go through the next three weeks, I'll say this. I think that we, the collective we, have that entire concept completely backwards. We all know the name of Jesus. Even non-Christians know the name of Jesus. It's common. It's, 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 it's famous even. But I think where we fall short is not knowing who Jesus is. Not just his name, but who he is, why he did what he did. Not just that he was born, that he died and he rose again, but why did he do those things? And for the next few weeks, we're going to dive into knowing the heart of God through Jesus in an intimate way. So that's what we're going to do, at least this week. We're going to set off on a journey to unpack who Jesus is and why he came to the earth in the way that he did, why he served the way that he served and why he suffered the way that he suffered and why he rose from the grave victorious over sin and death for all of humankind. Now I can sit up here for the next 20 minutes and give you my opinion on these things, what I think, but I won't because I don't have to. There is so much scripture about who Jesus is that all we have to do, you could pick your Bible up and flop it open. And you're probably within a page of some type of descriptor of who Jesus is. It's not a mystery. And yet there's so many people who don't know. Maybe they refuse to know. Maybe they have no desire to know. Or maybe there's those of us who are too lazy to look and to know who Jesus is. And I might date myself with this statement, but I don't feel bad. Ben does this all the time. And I'm not going to date myself as far as Ben, because he always has like 60s and 70s movies references. I'm an 80s kid. So those of you who grew up uh, in the 80s and 90s or watch TV, uh, you'll remember a show called Reading Rainbow, yes. right? LeVar Burton. And at the end of every show, they'd introduce a new book, right? But instead of him talking about it, he would, he would defer to a child who had already read that book. And so he'd introduce the book and he'd say, it's great, but you don't have to take my word for it. Well, here we go. You don't have to take my word for it because we're going to take Jesus's word for it this morning. There's a lot of scripture about what the disciples and what other people had to say about Jesus. Lots of them. But what we're going to focus on is what Jesus said about himself. This isn't hearsay. This isn't third-hand information. This isn't so-and-so told so-and-so that told so-and-so about Jesus. This is Jesus saying, this is who I am, directly from the source. And so for those of you who still don't know where we're going with this, we are going to be looking at these I am statements of Jesus. There's, there's seven of them that are, that are a little more... Um, kind of maybe harder to have wrap our heads around. There's more than just the seven, but these seven that we're going to look at starting today through Easter is where we're going. And I want to keep these kind of floating in our brains for the next couple of weeks as we lead up to Easter. And again, these seven statements, I want to say this again, these are not the only times that Jesus talked about himself and his purpose and his heart, but these seven I am statements give us a glimpse at the nature and character of God. These are Jesus' own words, and Jesus himself, God, the Son of God, God with us. This is our glimpse at the nature of God. Not some distant massive force in the universe, but here we have Jesus in the flesh, Emmanuel, God with us, telling us about his nature and his purpose. And we're not going to get through all of them this week. So we're going to pick them apart over the next few weeks leading up to Easter. But we're going to get rolling. And, and some of these are in multiple books, but we're going to be looking in the book of John. They all exist in the book of John. So if you have your Bibles, you can flip open. And we're going to jump around a little bit. And we're going to be leaving some of them alone. I got to leave something for, for you know Ben for the next couple of weeks. So our first one is going to be in uh, chapter 8, verse 12. And this is one I think that a lot of people are familiar with. And it goes like this it says, again, Jesus spoke to them saying, I am the light of the world. Whoever follows me will not walk in darkness, but will have the light of life. 
And again, most of us are familiar with that, but let's go, let's go back. Let's slow the tape down a little bit, okay? So in this exchange, Jesus is going back and forth with Pharisees. These are people that are not happy that Jesus is there and who Jesus is claiming to be. They're grilling him on what or who he is. And Jesus' response is simple. He says, I am the light of the world. And their response was, paraphrasing, of course, uh, says you. Just because you say it doesn't make it true. Here we have people who, who know the Old Testament. They know the law. They know the prophecy. And Jesus is claiming a number of things with that one statement. He's telling us a couple things about himself. First, Jesus is telling everyone who's listening that he is the one who is there to fulfill a number of Old Testament promises regarding what? The coming light, the coming salvation of God. There's no fewer than, than eight. There's at least eight. Eight I read. There's probably more uh, Old Testament references to this prophecy, the coming light, the coming salvation of God that's being fulfilled in the person of Jesus in his work. And he's saying this in one statement. In this one statement, he's also declaring his divinity. He's declaring his purpose. And the very people that have been waiting for generations only have a response of, says you. We don't know you. They actually respond with this. They say, you need the testimony of two people to make something true. Just because you say it doesn't make it true. You're only one person. We need the testimony of two people. And Jesus' response to that is great in verse 17, where he says this, <clears throat> in your law, it is written that the testimony of two people is true. I am the one that bears witness about myself, and the Father who sent me bears witness about me. Okay, so they ask, they say, where's your, where's your Father? And Jesus replies, you know neither me nor my Father. If you knew me, you would know my father also. Jesus is saying his father, God, has already told you about me. You know the scriptures. You know the prophecies. He's already told you about me. I don't know, in Exodus and Leviticus and Psalms and Isaiah. And here I am telling you, just in case this wasn't clear enough, I'm here. There's also some importance to these words, and this is going to apply to a lot of all the I am statements. But those two words together, I am, have a very holy connotation for the Jews that would have been listening to this. Including these Pharisees in Jerusalem, those two words together, I am, are used as the name and identity of God. This comes from all the way back in Exodus when God told Moses, I am who I am. So you shall tell the sons of Israel that I am has sent me to you. And from then on, all of God's people throughout history have known God as I am. So let, let's, let's pause again for just one second. There are times that we read about in scripture where Jesus loved and he served and he healed and he fed and he taught. And he served while kind of withholding his identity. And this is not one of those times. This is Jesus telling the crowd, telling these Pharisees, I am the son of God. I am God with you. And here's a little more context for this statement. Something had just wrapped up. Right before Jesus said this, there was a festival that had just, just wrapped up in Jerusalem. It was the, the Feast of Booze or Feast of Tabernacles. And during this feast, what they would do is they would light these giant torches in the temple grounds. And, and they would light the, the torches with oil and the, the priest's old clothing from the last year. And these torches would stay lit throughout the festival so that people could come and worship in darkness, rather in the light. And those lights, those, those, those torches, they were there to represent something. They were there to represent God's presence with his people as they were in the wilderness. As they were going to the promised land, right? You guys all remember this story. We're not going to go read it, right? Where God led his people as a pillar of fire through the wilderness. This is what these torches represented. God's presence with his people. And here Jesus is saying, I am the light of the world. 
I'm here. It's me. You want light? I am the light. You're focusing on these torches that represent God's presence with you. I am God's presence with you. Are we picking up what Jesus is putting down here? You know, we sing songs in church, right, about the light of the world, the great I am. Do we understand what we are singing, what we're saying, and what we're reading? Jesus is simply saying, I am God here in the flesh with you to bring that promised light, to bring that promised salvation. Follow me and be in the light, because apart from me, there is nothing but darkness. Our next I am statements come out of John chapter 10. And this is one that probably not quite so many songs have been written about. Probably a lesser known I am statement of Jesus. You know, we know light of the world and the bread and all that, but this one is a little different. Starting in John chapter 10, verse seven, here we see Jesus talking to the people and saying this. He says, truly, truly, I say to you, I am the door of the sheep. All who came before me are thieves and robbers, but the sheep did not listen to them. I am the door. If anyone enters by me, he will be saved and will go in and out and find pasture. The thief comes only to steal and kill and destroy. I came that they may have life and have it abundantly. And we have to stop here for, uh, let's stop reading or we're going to actually read the next I am statement. So we're going to stop there. So what is Jesus telling us here? G what is Jesus telling us about himself other than uh, some of the points we know that apply to all these I am statements? I am the door to the sheep. What is that about? And it actually makes a little more sense if we go back and we start reading in verse one. And there's a reason I did this backwards. The verses leading up to that uh, I am statement, verse one starts with this. Truly, truly, I say to you, he who does not enter the sheepfold by the door but climbs in another way, that man is a thief and a robber. But he who enters by the door is the shepherd of the sheep. To him, the gatekeeper opens. The sheep hear his voice and he calls his own sheep by name and he leads them out. When he has brought out all his own, he goes before them and the sheep follow him for they know his voice. A stranger they will not follow, but they will flee from him for they do not know the voice of strangers. And then the people went, what? They didn't understand what he was saying. And then he follows it up with the I am statement of, guys, I'm the door. I'm the door to the sheep. So real quick, we're, we're, we're getting some imagery about a sheep enclosure, a sheep hold, sheepfold. And, and those of you who have seen, you know, pictures in the Middle East or maybe uh, have been there, you, you know, there's the, they can be a, even something as simple as a cave or some type of rock walled enclosure where maybe multiple families would put their sheep. And here we see Jesus making a very exclusive statement. I am the door, not a door, the door that leads to the sheepfold. And he is the only door through which we can enter and be saved. What I find interesting, again, is that he, he talks, he tells this whole story that this wonderful illustration, and then the people were like, what, what? And only when he says, I am the door, does it start to make sense. And these are people that actually lived around sheep. And so we have to look maybe, maybe some of the cultural aspects of what he was saying and why this is important. First of all, sheep are helpless. They, they spend all of their day eating. They have their heads down, and all they do is they wander from one patch to the next. And because they're always got their, they always have their heads down and they're always just looking for food, sheep have a tendency to get lost, just plugging along until they get lost. And by nature, sheep are followers. If you put multiple sheep together, they'll clump together. And they will follow them, each other, to their death. Sheep are also very easy prey. If a predator gets into that sheepfold, sheep don't, def sheep don't uh, defend themselves, right? They don't, like, kick and chew and gnaw. They just clump together. 
and they're slaughtered. They're an easy target. And I think that says more probably about us than it does Jesus. But Jesus tells us something about himself in this statement. He's telling us, yes, you are helpless, but you know my voice. And when you hear my voice, you know where I am. You know where safety is because I know you by name. You know my voice and you can enter in. And when you're out and about in life, you follow me. You won't get lost. We have this picture of this loving master who who possesses us, who loves us intimately because we are his. We belong to him. And again, this is a great glimpse at the heart of God through Jesus that we are loved, that we are valued, that we are worth saving. Not because we deserve it, but because he loves us and he values us. He wants us to follow him where he would lead us because it's going to be good. And only through him can we get there. I think we have time for one more. So we're going to jump ahead to John chapter 15. And this comes right after Captain Obvious here, right after chapter 14. But in chapter 14, Jesus is having a it's a tough discussion with his disciples. In chapter 14, Jesus had just got done telling his disciples that one of them will betray him, that he's going to be leaving them, at least in an earthly sense. And no doubt the air in the room was a little bit heavy. And this is when Jesus says this in chapter 15, he says this, I am the true vine and my father, the vine dresser. Every branch in me that does not bear fruit, he takes away. And every branch that does bear fruit, he prunes, that it may bear more fruit. Already you are clean because of the word that I have spoken to you. Abide in me and I in you. As the branch cannot bear fruit by itself unless it abides in the vine. Neither can you unless you abide in me. I am the vine. You are the branches. Whoever abides in me and I in him, he it is that bears much fruit. For apart from me, you can do nothing. In this story, Jesus is using this story as part of this kind of earthly farewell to his disciples. And this is actually the last of the seven I am statements. Again, I'm going to save some good ones for Ben, too. And this I am statement, again, affirms this relationship between God and his covenant people. And remember, Jesus is effectively saying goodbye for now (laughs) with this. But again, reassuring his disciples that, that while they wouldn't have him physically there with them anymore, that the spiritual reality was that he would continue to sustain them, to nourish them, just as a vine supports the individual branches while they're producing fruit. Jesus was, again, telling us here about himself, who he is as God with us, that he would be and is with us, that we are connected to him, that we need to be connected to him in order to produce fruit. And even went so far as to say, if we are not rooted in Christ, that if we're not grafted into the source of our spiritual nourishment, that not only would we not produce fruit, but that there would be death. That being disconnected from the source of our spiritual nourishment has dire consequences. Jesus talks about these branches that have to be pruned because they produce no fruit. These, these, these branches that would also be connected to the vine, but they're not producing anything. Jesus is talking about those people who claim Christ with their lips, but deny Christ by everything that they do. They are a branch in name only. And those branches, those people who really haven't fully surrendered to the vine, to Jesus, to rely on him for everything. These verses tell us that Jesus is here to meet all of our needs, spiritual and otherwise, that we are completely dependent on him to produce fruit, things like goodness and faithfulness and peace and joy and self-control, so that our lives would point other people to the vine. (laughs) 
Our world is full of people who know of Jesus. Even the, the, the church world, the big us, is full of people that know just enough about God to know what to sing or, or what to say, or they've memorized enough Bible verses out of context to make it seem like everything's going to be okay. There's a lot of people in this country that if given a choice would check the box. Yeah, I'm a Christian. If given a choice. That are a branch that maybe are connected to the vine, but not the true vine that are living in the dimness of this world because they have yet to fully grasp Jesus as the light of the world. People that are still wandering around, uh, lost, following the crowd because they don't know the voice of the shepherd. Because they've never known Jesus personally. And folks, there is an infinite difference between knowing Jesus' name and truly knowing Jesus. Amen. And as we pray this morning, I want all of us to, to examine our own hearts and our own lives. And again, this is part of this season leading up to Easter. I want God to show us where there's areas of our lives where we are rooted in the wrong vine. Where we are depending on the things of this world instead of being firmly rooted in Jesus. I want to ask the, the Holy Spirit to convict us of things in our lives that have led us away from the shepherd. Areas in our life where we're ignoring his voice when he's calling us by name. I want to ask God to squeeze our hearts and to show us where we are hiding in the darkness instead of living in to the light of Christ. Let's bow our heads and pray. Lord, we thank you for your goodness and your faithfulness to us. Lord, we come to you today as a people that have failed, that have wandered, that have become distracted by the things of this world. And we ask that you would help us to draw closer to you, to abide in you daily. We pray that as a people that our fruit would be plentiful, that as a church that our fruit would point others to you, that the kingdom of heaven would grow, and that more people would come to know you in a personal way through Jesus. We pray that it would be our heart's desire to, to pursue a deeper understanding of your heart and your love for us. And Lord, we ask for your continued blessings, that our obedience to your will would reflect your light into a world that so desperately needs it. Amen. All right, once again, if you're willing and able, I'll invite you to stand. He became sin. He humbled himself and carried the cross. Love so
All righty, we're going to do some praying here in just a second as soon as I can get this guitar hung up. All righty, grab a seat if you haven't already. Um, yeah, let's go ahead and bow our heads in prayer this morning. Lord, we thank you for, again, for your faithfulness, your goodness to us. Uh, that you love us even when we screw up and we're jacked up and uh, we mess so much stuff up in this world to know that you are a God who loves us and wants to see us restored in a relationship with you, Lord. Lord, we pray for us as a church in this ministry. Uh, we pray that we would continue to be obedient and be faithful to your call for us here. Oh, Lord, we pray for our community. We pray for uh, Muldoon Elementary School, who is currently going through a search for a new principal. And we know, Lord, that you have blessed us greatly in our relationship with that school and the current principal. And Lord, we just uh, pray over the incoming principal that they would be someone who would be willing to team with us uh, so that we can show the love of Christ to the students in that school, Lord. Uh, we pray for Pastor Ben as he travels back to us today. We pray that his time over this last week in Chicago um, was fruitful. And we uh, just pray again that we get him back to us safe and sound and ready to rock and roll. Uh, we pray for the Alaska Conference that has their uh, semi-annual meeting uh, this week. And again, we pray for wisdom and discernment. Uh, and we pray that there would be good fellowship uh, for all the ministers here in our conference, Lord. We pray for those in our midst that are suffering from illness, Joe and her eyes and Abby with her thyroid. And I know we have a lot of people who are um, still healing from surgeries uh, and, and other things, Lord. And again, you know, all of our bodies, Lord, and you, I would just pray healing over them, peace over them, Lord. We pray for our offering. We pray uh, for all the gifts um, that are received that again, we would use those faithfully, uh, that you would multiply them so that the kingdom of heaven would grow, Lord. We pray that those in our community that were, as we do outreach, as we're using those funds, Lord, uh, that people would come to know you in a real and personal way through Jesus, and that the light of Jesus is something that we would reflect out into the darkness of this world, Lord. We pray for our nation and our world. Uh, there's a lot of things happening across the world, Lord, and, and I know I would pray that you would keep us from picking sides, Lord, because the side we belong to is yours. I would pray that even when bad things are happening in the world, Lord, that you would equip us, you would strengthen us, and you would send us into a world that will and constantly be jacked up, Lord, but we go with your love. Lord, we pray for our meeting next week uh, and meetings that are going to happen leading up to this as we as a church decide where our talents go, Lord. What the future of this ministry is and who we can reach with what you have blessed us with already, Lord. We thank you again for everything that you have done for us and you continue to do. In the mighty name of Jesus, we all pray. Amen. Amen. With that, just a couple of announcements. Um, and I think we actually prayed for them. Um, but uh, real quick, Muldoon Elementary School has a number of field trips coming up that they need adult chaperones for. Uh, I think Tina has the list of what those are. So if that's something, some of them are just a couple hours long, kids going to the zoo or something like that. If that's something you would like to help with, uh, just get with Tina and she can hook you up with some details. Um, big announcement. I know Ben talked about this last week. Next Sunday after church, we'll be having our uh, congregational meeting. Uh, and there will be some discussion on, uh, on Micah and uh, kind of the, the future of our youth program and stuff like that. So please plan next Sunday and sticking around a little bit. I know most of you do already, but after church next Sunday, uh, we'll be having that meeting. And that will be on Zoom. So if you do uh, dial in on Zoom, we'll have the meeting uh, available there also. Um, oh, that was the other thing. It's Chris's birthday. 
Yeah. You're like, what is your uh, 85, 84? No. What? Yeah. 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 Do we have any other birthdays this week? Just Chris? Anybody else? Going once? Going twice? All right. Let's sing happy birthday to Chris. Then. Here we go. Happy birthday to you. Happy birthday to you. Happy birthday, dear Chris. Happy birthday to you. All right, yay. Uh, just to make sure, this is Bruce Stingley. You may not remember. <laughs> yeah. So Bruce, yeah. So Bruce, uh, Bruce, Julie and Bruce are back. So Bruce, unlike me, can actually pull off a mustache. So there's that. It's, it's a bad day. To, no. Yeah. <laughs> All right. Hey, guys, receive this blessing. Uh, grace and peace be multiplied unto you through the knowledge of God and of Jesus, our Lord. Amen.